Hello everybody and welcome back. I hope this video finds you well. Um, in our last video, we looked a bit at the Colombian exchange and at some uh, early effects of European civilization. Today I want to talk about the Protestant Reformation in Europe and how the Protestant Reformation in England led to some of England's early colonization in the Americas. One of the best known examples of early English colonization is that of the Pilgrims, who enjoyed the first Thanksgiving with some American Indians. But who were the Pilgrims, and how did they wind up in North America? Well, it's a bit of a story, so get comfortable. Before the Protestant Reformation, there was only one official Christian church. It's the church that we today call the Roman Catholic Church. To represent this church, we will use the Pope from the start of the Reformation, it was Pope Leo X. Put him up top and center. The first major break from the church came in 1517 from this German monk, Martin Luther. On October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther posted a series of complaints against the church on the door of the cathedral. He was not out trick-or-treating, but he knew that October 31st was the eve of All Saints Day, and that that next day, everybody would be attending Mass and would see his complaints nailed up on the church door. His two biggest complaints against the church involved first, number one, all of the scriptures and church services were written in Latin, and therefore were only accessible to the church and to the clergy. He wanted the Bible to be translated and accessible to believers of all language groups. His second major complaint was against the sale of indulgences. Now, indulgences kind of sped your way through purgatory. If you're not Catholic and you're not familiar with the concept of purgatory, just think of it like a big waiting room to get into heaven. Nobody likes sitting in a waiting room, right? So, in order to speed past this process, while they were still alive, people would buy these little slips from the church called indulgences. Of course, from today's standards, that sounds like a big load of malarkey. Paying your way to salvation, alright? Well, Luther saw through that, and he stood up against it. He argued for justification by faith, rather than being able to buy your way to salvation. So once again, Martin Luther's two major complaints were against the sale of indulgences, and against scripture not being readily available to all the people, and being only written in Latin. So let's put him branched off from the original Christian church. About 20 years after Luther and his followers broke from the church, this French theologian, Jean Calvin, wrote a book called The Institutes of Christian Religion, in which he advocated the doctrine of predestination. Basically, it argues that God's will already has everything predestined and set in stone. God already knows everything that's going to happen exactly as it's going to happen, including which souls are already destined for salvation. So therefore, God already knows who's going to go to heaven and who's not, to put it simply. So by today's standards, we might be thinking, Hell yeah, bro, live it up! I don't even got to worry about it! I'm either set to go to heaven or I'm not, so let's go sin it up. Well, Calvin and his followers had quite a bit different way of looking at things. They were so devout that they were willing to live up to the will of God, whether or not they were members of what they called the elect. The elect came to be the collective name for Calvin and his followers in hopes that they were among the select few who would make it into the kingdom of heaven. So... Second major break from the church came the French theologian Jean Calvin. Put him off to the right here. In Tudor England, King Henry VIII initially took a firm stance against the Reformation and stood by the Pope, earning him the title Defender of the Faith. This changed, however, when he wanted to get an annulment, that is, a technical divorce granted from the Pope, from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. 
He would have five wives after her, but we're not going to get too into that right now. When the Pope said, hey man, there's no way of not recognizing this marriage as being legitimate, Henry said, well, screw you. Yeah, yeah, the whole Defender of the Faith thing? Nah, I'm leaving your church, bro. And split from the church, forming his own church, the Church of England, of which he made himself Supreme Head. As Supreme Head of the Church of England, also known as the Anglican Church, King Henry VIII was able to grant himself an annulment and go on to have five other wives in his quest to have a male heir. So let's go ahead and put him down among these who have broken from the church. Now the Church of England was not much different from the original church. Remember, after all, King Henry was the defender of the faith. He liked most things about the church, especially now that he was in charge of it all and getting all the benefits. There were a few major differences between the Anglican Church and the original Catholic Church. One being that members of this church could openly divorce. Convenient for King Henry, no? But all in all, the services of the church and the way the church was structured was very similar. If you've ever been to an Episcopalian church, which is a branch off from the Anglican Church, you'll notice that it's very similar to a Catholic Mass. You can close your eyes and almost know exactly what to do if you grew up in the Catholic Church. Some members of the church didn't like how similar this church was. They felt like it hadn't broken away enough. These members wanted a nice, pure, simple congregation without all the stained glass and complicated church clergy and complicated services. This group sought to purify the Church of England from within, thus earning them the name Puritans. So, branched off from the Church of England, or Anglican Church, which had branched off from the original church, now known as the Roman Catholic Church, comes the Puritans. Remember, they want to purify the Church of England from within. Branched off of the Puritans was a group called Separatists, who believed that there was no way of purifying the church from within. It was just too corrupt. The only way to have the true, pure type of congregation which they were seeking was to completely break away from this church. Puritans, and especially Separatists, who wished to break away from the church, were subject to persecution. Not only were they committing blasphemy by speaking against the church, but remember, the king of England had made himself supreme head of the church. Therefore, their desire to break from the church was also considered treason. So, a group of separatists, which became known as pilgrims, left England and founded the Plymouth Colony in North America as a haven for them to practice their religion. Keep in mind... Their goal was not to have complete religious freedom, but to escape religious persecution. Big difference. So, branched off of the Puritans, who wanted to purify the church, were the Separatists, some of whom traveled to North America and became known as Pilgrims. The arrival of Separatist Pilgrims in North America is far from the only or most significant impact of the Protestant Reformation. In fact, there had already been English colonization in North America before the Pilgrims even arrived. So what were some of the other lasting legacies of the Protestant Reformation? Following the Reformation, a greater deal of emphasis was placed upon translating the Bible and making it available to speakers of all languages. The Reformation also gave birth to almost all of the major Christian traditions which would take root in America. Furthermore, following the Reformation, priests and other religious clergy were made to seem more human than saint-like. On a similar note, following the Reformation, there was a rise in questioning of the divine right of monarchs. Furthermore, the Protestant Reformation gave rise to a new crusading spirit throughout Europe from both Catholics and Protestants that coincided with the emergence of nation-states and helped fuel 
A desire for overseas expansion. In the next video, we will look more into English colonization and the different kinds of colonies which the English created in North America.